If he's good, give him praise. Is he good? Give him praise. If he's good, give him praise. Because he deserves the praise. Amen. Psalms 145, verse 9 says this The Lord is good to all. Awesome. Amen. And his tender mercies are over all his works. If you look to your left, if you look to your right, that's God's working. We're a testimony of his goodness. We're a testimony that God is working. And he turned mercies all over our lives. Amen. Amen. We're going to go before the Lord with a prayer request. Amen. We've got a few here. Sister Didi wants to pray for Pastor Armando Luna and family. Cousins and family got hit, uh, involved in a hit and run accident. And listen, they lost their four-year-old daughter. The father and the son are in the hospital. And pray for the driver to turn himself in. Amen. Terry, Terry, uh, uh, visiting us from uh, Lord, Lawrenceburg, New Mexico. Amen. She's family. She's family. Amen. She's family. She says this prayer for all of our people for peace and love. She wants prayer for her relationship and all, or for her to get close to the Lord always. Amen. Here's a prayer for Sister Melissa. She's not feeling good. Uh, today, having pain in her stomach, pains in her stomach, please lift her up in prayer. Thank you. Mama Rosie wants to pray for comfort for mom's services tomorrow. Amen. Her mom's. Pray that her celebrate, pray for her celebration of going home and celebrating. Amen. We're with you, sister. My wife, Terry Fleur, wants to pray for her sister, Mary, uh, Mary McNeil. For a quick recovery, she also wants uh, to please continue to pray for her niece Monica, um, healing from cancer. Amen? Amen. And also for a home for her mom, her sister, and her brother. Amen. Amen. Pastor Johnny is asking to lift up uh, Jose Juarez for God's will to be done in his life, for God's healing hand of deliverance, deliverance from cancer. Amen. Amen. Also, um, prayer for the Sandoval family and Christian. Amen. God knows. God knows what's going on. And little Ethan, listen to little Ethan. Ethan, listen to. Help me, Lord. Thank you. That's his prayer. That's his prayer. Amen. I could I could add to that, but I'm going to leave it like that. I could add to that, but I'm going to leave it like that. Amen. We said. <laughs> We serve a good God. We serve a good God. The Lord is good, not to one person. That's right. He's good to all. He's, he's good to all who opens their hearts to Him. Amen. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come before this morning, Lord. Thanking you for your goodness, Lord. Thanking you for your goodness, Father God. Your word says that you are good to all. Not to one, not to a few, but to all, Father. And your tender mercies, Lord God, are all over your words, Father. And we see that, Father God, because we stand in your promises this morning, Lord. We stand in the promises of your goodness, Lord. We stand in the promises of your faithfulness, Lord God. And we stand in your promises, Lord God, of you being real in our lives, Father. This morning, we pray that the Holy Spirit will touch each and every heart this morning. Open up our hearts, Father God. Clear our minds, Lord God, to receive what you have for us today. We pray for that guest speaker today, that, that the Holy Spirit will move within his heart, Lord God. And bring forth a message that would touch our heart, Lord. Let your spirit just move, Lord God, within this place, Lord. Let us celebrate your goodness, Father God. Father God, we be glory in Jesus' mighty name. And the church says, Amen and Amen. Let's turn around and wave at each other, Amen. Air fives, air fives. We're almost there. Not quite yet, though. Air fives. I'm looking forward to it, right? Actually, I got to tell you, one of the things that used to happen here, you can be seated in, 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 uh, in the Almani congregation, is that it was like an intermission. Now, I'm, I'm surprised there wasn't you know, popcorn and zoom zooms and wham whams passed out. Intermission, man. People turn around and start shaking hands. And this side would go to that side, and that side come to this side. And then trying to get everybody back into their seat, it was complicated. And then COVID. And then everyone was going...
We're working through this. We are the body of Christ. And so we're working through this. Can you say amen? All right. Let me share a couple of things with you as we step into this week. This is a good week. I know some of you have been watching uh, Pastor Ruben's Facebook. He's got a mini revival going on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, Thursday night, people are uh, welcome to, to, to visit. On Fridays, we have small groups. I would, I would challenge you to attend your small group and be a part of that because that's where the action is. That's where the family is knitted. Can you say amen? So, so there's good things happening. To those of you on our Monday nights, our Monday night, tomorrow night, we're on. Well, that was a delayed reaction right there. Did you see that? Thank you, Anna. Did you see that, though? It was like, we're on. It was like, oh, yeah. So let me share with you. Those of you men that have been reading through chapter number 10. Oh, man, here we go. Chapter number 3, okay? We are not going to move on to chapter number 4 till we have a meeting, till we sit down, till we go through 3. I hope you've been following some of the homework that I've been sending you and texting to you guys, to you gentlemen. On uh, you brothers on Monday night, those of you ladies, I think you're in chapter number three also. Are you in chapter number three also? I don't know how they do that, man, but they're doing it. And so I just want to recommend that you go through it because you know what? Monday nights, a, a lot of you brothers, you, you're, I don't know if you're reading through because you got no questions. And I read through and I got questions of my own. So if you're reading, bring those questions. If you put some questions, I want something defined, something explained. That's what we want to do. Uh, Brother Alfonso started this off two weeks ago, we'll finish it off tomorrow night, and then I think it worked out really well that you had your, your homework kind of ahead of you, and so at the end of the class tomorrow, maybe you guys can turn those fans on, because I feel like a chicharron right here. I'm feeling it. I, was gonna, I, can't, I don't have a Superman shirt on, so I can't take my shirt off, but um, you know, sometimes it helps having the lesson ahead of time so tomorrow night we're going to pass out chapter four so that you'll get a chance a little bit ahead of time to go through it before the following monday that'd be all right i know i know you ladies you guys are really excited this morning i can tell oh. and by home those of you watching on facebook say something oh wait they can huh all right let me get my act together here a little bit so our Monday nights are ready to roll, okay? Last week was a holiday, but we're ready to roll. Bring your lessons, and we are going to have a great Monday night. Wednesday night, I am working on starting a couple of messages on the Holy Spirit. So I just want to let you know, don't miss out. we got a lot of good things planned. God is moving, and so let's let him move. Can you say amen? He's moving. Those prayer requests that you heard, those prayer requests that people are lifting up, keep those on your heart, especially for those families that have just uh, really had a, a, a tragic situation that we want to pray for them. And, and Sister Mary, I'm believing for a miracle. In those families, and Sister Mary's, I'm believing for a miracle because our God, he knows how to do miracles. Can you say amen? Okay, if I didn't cover everything, I promise you I'll cover it by the time we leave here. Let's give the Lord a hand clap while we get ready to give to the Lord. Come on. I want to read you a portion of scripture out of the book of Romans. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter number 12. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, I made a point in one of my message, uh, one of my messages that about people who date the church. They date churches. And I know dating is not a popular subject with all of us. One of the reasons why is because most of us only know what we learn in the world. Okay, five of you are honest, the rest of you are going, what is he talking about? It's, an, it's important to know that, that dating is a public thing. Most people, when they're saved, living for God, and they're, they're dating, they usually, they usually let it be known so that people can watch them. Why? Because how you date is a part of your testimony. It's a part of who you are in Christ. You need to do what you remember your, you remember your mom telling you, portate bien. Paul writes to the Roman church, and he says, verse 4, of chapter number 12 for 
as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. Can we say amen? amen. Okay. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing. We're not all the same. We don't have the same talents. We don't have the same abilities. We don't have the same gifts. It's supposed to be like that. He says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let me say it again. Let us use them. Okay? I lost my place. Let us use it in our ministering or ministry. Let us prophesy in the portion that God has given us. I'm going backwards here. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given, let, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith or in ministry. Let us, let us in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation. If you have a gift of, of lifting people up and helping them, helping them get to feel better, do it. We need it. We need Barnabases in the house. Can you say amen? Sons and daughters of consolation. When people are on, having a difficult time and they're on a bummer to lift up their spirits. He who gives should do it with liberality. He who leads should do it with diligence. If you're a leader, you should diligently be a leader, not haphazardly be a leader. He who shows mercy should do it also with mercy or mercifully. People sometimes date churches because they're looking for the best place to go. Just like looking for the best mate to find. Different things, different ways. Sometimes they check one place out and it has an error. And then they have to leave. They got to move on to another place. And they discover that everywhere they go, there's problems. Well, it's like dating and it fits right into dating. Because dating, you'll realize that everybody is not perfect. When you think something is perfect, you realize, oh, it's not perfect at all. I remember some wisdom my pastor had given to a few people. I was, I was privileged to be in the room when he talked to somebody that was single. It was an older person he was talking about, not older, you know, way older, but it was a mature person he talked about dating. And my, and my pastor made this statement. He says, have you seen, have you seen her mad? And it was like, his answer was like, uh, no, he goes, you need to see her mad. You need to see what it's like when they're angry. That goes both ways. That goes both ways, right? Right, because, you know, if it's all peaches and cream and when the figs fall and they're rotten, you're in a lot of trouble. So what's it about? It's about finding and discovering, right? Your life is here for a reason. Amen. You might think in your mind, I just kind of like it here. It's kind of cool. People are like groovy, but you know, I'm, I don't know. No, your life has a purpose here. Amen. You, say me. me. That's right. You help the church yes, sir. be what it's supposed to be. Yes, sir. God puts you here because there's something in you that he placed there. You might not even realize it. There is something in your life. There's an ability. There's a part of your character. There's something you know, something that it could be a talent, could be a gift. There's something in your life that God wants it for his church. Say amen. In order for the church to be what it's supposed to be, you have to be what you're supposed to be. One of, the, one of the great men of our, of our 20th century, 19th century, was Martin Luther King. And his quotes are incredible. Martin Luther King made a statement to, to, the, to the crowds that were following his non, non what was it called? Uh, the protest was a non-violent protest. He made the statement. He said this as a leader. He said, I cannot be everything I need to be until you are everything you need to be. He said, if I as a leader do everything I think needs to be done, but you don't do what you need to be, then I am doing everything for nothing. 
When it comes to following the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not a solo sport. You cannot follow Christ alone. I want to do Jesus, but I want to do him my way in my house. And I don't want to be bothered by people. Well, people are what make you a Christian. Iron sharpens iron. And sometimes God will purposely put somebody around you that irritates you. I got a drinking problem here. Pray for the preacher, huh? And God does things like that on purpose. Sometimes the loud person, God puts around the quiet person to calm yourself down. Sometimes the quiet and timid person, God puts around the open and loud person to get you to kind of open up a little bit and not be so scared. God knows exactly what he's doing. He linked Barnabas, who was a son of consolation, with the apostle Paul. Go figure. Barnabas wanted to help everybody. Paul kind of thought, well, if they won't receive help, let's just cut their heads off. Paul was a tough guy. He didn't make a whole lot of friends. Made a lot of disciples. Started a lot of churches. But he wasn't invited to probably a whole lot of parties that went on and barbecues that were had. Barnabas, he was the first guy I thought of. Why does God do things like that? Because God knows where everybody fits. And people who don't put themselves in a place, sit their butt down in a chair, and, and be what they're supposed to be in that church, they never experience everything that God has for them. Why do I say all this? Because your giving is important. Your giving is important. Your giving reflects your heart. Well, you know, I've been trying. Well, you know, Jesus didn't try to save you. He didn't just try to go to the cross. Ah, it's too hard. The Bible says he endured to the end. And when you ask for his forgiveness, like I did, like all of us did, he pardoned you. Immediately. Look at your neighbor say, immediately. Immediately you were forgiven. The slate was wiped clean. All of the things you thought were needed for perfection, they were gone. Now you reflect him. And everything you do testifies to how good God is. So if he's good, and if he's worthy of being called good, then he's worthy of our support of his church. Because he's coming for his church. That's what the Bible says. He is coming for his bride. And who's the bride? We are. The church. We're the bride. Let's stand to our feet. Can we all across this building here? You can't do life on your own. You got to do it with us. These ladies have offering envelopes. Sister Bernie, could you bring me one also? Hallelujah. If you need one, raise your hand. Man, I don't know if they can read that. I feel, I feel, bad, I feel bad sometimes. Those sisters in there, what is that? I think I'm going to send them to a class on crypt cryptology or something. People that study those ancient writings and stuff like that. Gentlemen, ushers, could you come on up? I want to be everything that Christ has called me to be. Can you say amen? amen. Church, is, church is for us, but it's not about us. It's about him, but church is for us. And this, according to your Bible says, this is what demonstrates where our heart is at. Your heart can be given to the Lord really easy, but ooh, the wallet and the pocketbook... That really testifies 
where our heart is at. Let's bow our heads all across the building here, and we're going to pray over this in Jesus' name. Brother Oscar, over here at my left, would you pray over this offering for us? Gracious King. Help us, Father God, to, to return. Not even to return. It's yours anyway, Father God. Help us, Father God, to understand. Yes. God, your word, what it says to give, Father God. Yes. Because you have given us so much, Father God. Amen. Even when we don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord. I lift up, Father God, these tithes and these offerings, yes. Father God, to further your will, Father God, and to further your kingdom. Oh, my. In Jesus' name, and we all say. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's give to the Lord. Let's worship him. Give the Lord praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Hallelujah. This morning, Pastor David and Sister Desiree are here. They're, uh, they're in transit. Transit, right? Not transient, right? That's Oh, okay. Yeah. That, homeless. We, can, well, we don't want that to happen. Hallelujah. They're in transit. Hallelujah. As they are working their way up this week. Up into the Victor, Victor, no, the Hesperia, Apple Valley. And they're here this morning. I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to minister, and we're going to pray for them this morning as they get ready to just launch themselves up into the high desert. Would you give the Lord a great big hand clap as they come? Sister Desiree, can you come? And we just... Give everybody a, a little bit of a shout out this morning before your husband preaches because he needs it. I know him. He needs it. He needs a little bit of a, a little bit of an inspiration and stuff. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a blessing to be here at Amani Praise Chapel. Amen. And and you know, I just wanted to share with you guys. Um, just keep being faithful. You know, uh, you know, as pastors, wives. Pastor Didi, you understand what Pastor Phil goes through, you know, and I, and I encourage you all to continue to pray for your pastor, continue to support your pastor, because you know what, when, they, when he sees you here, you encourage him to do better, you know, and, and, and I say this because through the COVID, and when, you know, when we were at Fellowship of the Light, it was really difficult to go up there and only see five people. I started to miss, I started to miss them, you know, and, and when you're not here, he misses you guys. Pastor Duty misses you guys. So just, I just want to encourage you guys all to be faithful. I ask that you guys continue to pray for me and my husband through this journey. I'm really excited. I, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in us. You know, I'm, I'm really going to miss you guys, really. But I always say, if you need me, I'm just a ride away. You know, I, I tell David, I'm a big girl now. I could split names. You know, I don't need him no more. You know, so, you know, I, I just, I just, I just want to share that with you guys. Um, I love you guys, man. You know, um, you know, it, I just want to share this with you. If you guys didn't know this, but my journey really started here at Amani. Um, my husband had went through cancer, and my grandma died two weeks after that. My brother overdosed. Two weeks after that, my, my sister's grandma died. Two weeks after that, my grandpa died. Two weeks after that, and I was in this dark place. And I remember Pastor, um, Pastor Phil had an event here. It was a celebration service, and, you know, I was really struggling with my walk. Uh, and, and I remember my husband telling me, you're going to go to church. And, and I had just hurt my foot. And I said, okay. And I walked in, and I had a, um, I had a foot breast. I had something on my foot because I, you know, I was limping. And I remember um, David Diga calling. Um, he asked, if anybody needs prayer, come up here. And I, I was going to go up there because I, I needed a healing for my foot. I went to the doctors. They didn't know what was wrong with me. But... Um, you know, so I saw David, and I saw my husband go up there, and was praying for him for cancer, and I said, you know what, Lord, this is just a foot. So then I saw people come up here, they were getting delivered from type 2 diabetes. So he calls a final altar call, and he says, you know what, um, if you need a healing, come up here. I was right here, right here, and this, okay, and I'm big, but there's two people bigger than me, okay? And I said, I, I, and I saw him praying for people. I saw him praying for people, and, and they were falling. The, the ushers couldn't keep up with him. Finally, he comes, and he puts his hand on this couple. And this man, I kid you not, the Lord is my witness, and Pastor Vince, everybody saw five people behind me. He put his hand on him, and this man stepped on my foot. And he put my foot back into place. And he hit me. Boom. He hit me. Everybody fell right behind me. By the time I got up, by the time I got up, 
I was walking normal again. My foot was healed. From that day on, from that day on, my walk began with the Lord, and I was faithful. And, and so I want you guys to know that if, you know, if you're struggling, just keep asking God. He'll provide. You know, my husband prayed for me because I put him through so much. Let me tell you, I put him, I put this man through so much. And, and I thank God for his prayers. He knows this. You know, I admit it. I admit it because I see, you know, when I see somebody going through, I'm like, I know that feeling, you know. But I thank God for all your guys' prayers because they're working. Amen. I guess after that we can just go home. Let's just, let's just do the altar call, right? You don't need to hear what I have to say. After that. You just heard it, right? God, God heals. God heals. That, that's the message there. God heals. Anyway, it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, it, it, we're, I, I, am, I am so honored to be here, and, and, and I am so nervous to be here. It, it also, I, I probably shouldn't say that from the pulpit, but I, I have to say it because I haven't been in front of a, a, any congregation other than my own in like about three years. I think Harvest Festival was the last time I was up. So if I seem a little nervous, I am. As, as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs right now. But I'm going to get through it, all right, because I have the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart, and he will lead me, he will guide me, and he will give me the words to say, amen. So I want to thank you, Pastor Phil and Sister Didi and the Almighty Congregation for allowing me uh, to share this message that God has put on my heart with you today. Um, we're going to be in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 3. And we got a little, how many people here like to read the Bible? Yeah. I was hoping everybody would say yeah. So that's why we're here, right, to read the Bible, to understand what God wants for our lives and what, how God wants to, wants to use us, amen? That's, that's the important thing about it. You know, on Wednesday night, as you're looking up uh, chapter 3, we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 10, but as you're, how many people know the story of Moses, by the way? Okay, three people, four people know the story of Moses, five people here. So, <laughs> Pastor Phil, don't turn around and look, because... <laughs> Four people know the story of Moses. Okay, I'm just asking because I want to know how much I need to lead you, up, lead you through to get you up to where we're starting at. Because we're starting in verse 10 of chapter 3. And on Wednesday night, uh, Pastor Phil had mentioned to you all that we were, and he mentioned it again this morning, that we're moving to Apple Valley. And, and, the, and the truth is that we're, we're not just moving to Apple Valley. We're actually going up there to plant a church. You know, and, 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 and the funny thing is that if, if I had it my way, uh, I would not be going to Apple Valley. <laughs> My first choice was Eureka. We went and looked at Eureka. And we, we spent the weekend, about a week up there, and, and, and we really liked Eureka. It was really nice. The weather's really good. The beach is just right there. The mountains are just right there. And the weather is perfect all the time. It's just beautiful there. And, and, and that was where I wanted to go. I said, Lord, if you're going to take me into a promised land, then take me to this milk and honey land over here. And God, said, God slapped me in the back of the head, and he said, it's not where you want to go. It's where I need you to go. And so I'm sending you to Apple Valley. I'm sending you up there because I need you up there. And so that's why we're going to Apple Valley because the Lord has called us there. We've been praying for three years. Lord, open a door for us somewhere. Send us out so we can reach other people. Send us out to where you want us to go. And for three years we prayed. And after three years, God opened that door. He released us. And uh, we turned our church over to another pastor. And we're on our way out to uh, Apple Valley to open another church, to pioneer another church, to do God's will in, a, in another land. Amen? A lot of people say, hey, why, why are you... Why are, you go, why are you running from L.A.? I'm, I'm not running from L.A. I'm going to the desert to meet God. Isn't that what Moses did? Moses didn't run from Egypt. He went to the de he went, God took him to the desert so that God can meet with him there. And it was there that God revealed his plan. It was there that God revealed his purpose. So you may be sitting here and you may think, be thinking that God hasn't revealed anything to you. That God hasn't used you in the way that he wants to use you. Well, it's probably because you haven't answered when he's called and he said, I'm sending you. I'm sending you. That's what he said to Moses. He said to Moses, I'm sending you. Amen? Yes. So in chapter 10, where we're going to pick up, I just, want to, I just want to lead you through this a little bit. Moses is the, is the son of Jacobe. And, and Jacobe had a son named Moses. And, and it was during the time when uh, they were throwing all the, all the Hebrew babies into the river and killing them. Right. 
So she put her son into a little basket. She floated him down river. He was picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. He was taken into the palace. Well, he was nursed by his own mother first. Then he was taken into the palace. And he was raised in the, in, in the, in the, in the Egyptian royal, in Egyptian royalty. And, and according to Josephus, it, he, he was actually a, a very renowned and respected warrior. That he had led the, the Egyptians into a victory over the Ethiopians. So Moses, at this point, that he's, he's, he's uh, in Egypt, he, he, uh, he, uh, he, he gets into this, this thing when he finds this taskmaster beating these, uh, these, these uh, Israelites that, are, that, are argue, that were getting into something. He, so he, 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 he gets the taskmaster, he kills him, he buries him in the sand, and then he, he thinks nobody knows about it, but it's the, the next day it's found out as two Hebrews are fighting uh, with each other over something that he tries to stop the fight, and the Hebrews say to him, who made you ruler? Who made you judge of us? Right? So he knows now that... that Everybody knows what happened, that he killed these two, these, this taskmaster, and he buried him in the sand. And so then uh, Pharaoh gets upset, and he's angry with him. So Meryl, uh, uh, Moses flees Egypt, and he goes out into the, into the desert of, of Midian. And it is in Midian where he meets his wife, Zipporah, and she takes him home to meet her father-in-law, Ruel, or Jethro, whichever one you want to call I like Jethro because it reminds me of the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> That's how I write, right? Just look at everybody knows. I know the Beverly Hillbillies. So I like Jethro. So he meets his father-in-law Jethro, who's a Midianite priest. And the Midianites are the descendants of who? Ishmael. They're the descendants of Ishmael. Ishmael was taught by Abraham, his father, the same father who taught Isaac everything he needed to know about God, everything he needed to know about prayer, everything he needed to know about worship, everything he needed to know about God. So it was Jethro that, that Abraham, I mean Abraham, Moses went to stay with. And so we have to, it's, it's, it's okay for us, I don't say we have to, but it's okay for us to assume that Jethro taught Moses some things about God. It's okay for us to assume that, 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 that Moses learned probably more, more than, than his, Hebrew fellow, his fellow Hebrews about God from Jethro than anybody else. I'm out of breath, can you tell? I say that every time I come here, I always get out of breath. I don't know if the air is thinner here or not. <laughs> so at the time we find Moses, Moses has made his way up this mountain. And he's standing in up. The, uh, I have to tell you the size of this mountain, okay? Because a lot of times we hear that Moses went up this mountain. We think he just climbed up this little hill. But Mount Horeb was about uh, 7,500 feet high. Now, if you go out here and you look at Mount Baldy, Mount Baldy's... Uh, uh, it's it's 2,000 feet. So you can imagine how big Mount Horeb is and how much uh, Moses had to climb. Amen? So Moses, uh, he, he goes up this mountain. He, 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 he sees the fire burning on the mountain. He climbs up this mountain. The Bible says that he went up on that mountain to get a better look. That he, he climbed Mount Horeb so that he can, he can see what was up on the mountain. Well, he's up there, he, 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 he sees the fire and the angel talking to him in the burning bush. And then he, God tells him to take off his sandals because the land that he is standing on is holy ground. Right. Amen? And so, if you open your Bibles to chapter 4, verse 10, this is where we're stopped, starting at. Moses is standing there before God and God's about to reveal his plan and his purpose for Moses. How many of you understand that? That God is a, they, there's a, a lot of us here that God has revealed or he's in the process of revealing his plan and his purpose for us. Amen. Amen. So let's begin at, at verse 10. We'll read there. We'll say a short prayer and then we'll go on. Maybe I'll settle down by then. Amen. <laughs> verse 10. So now it says right here. So now in verse 10. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be to you a sign, the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. He's talking about Mount Horeb. Verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what? Then what shall I tell them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, 
the Lord. Everybody say the Lord. The Lord, the God of your fathers and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Verse 16, go assemble the elders in the, of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said that I, I have watched over you and I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. Verse 17, and I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Elamontites, and the East Elaites, Jebusites, and everybody in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah. And the elders of Israel will listen to you. And then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Say the Lord, our God. Verse 19. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you. This is a long read, so just bear with me. I have to do it because all of Moses' excuses are in these verses. Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Verse 20. So I will stretch out my hand and I will strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward, you, toward this people. So that when you leave, you will not go out empty handed. Somebody say, I'm not going out empty handed. Verse 22. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living uh, living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and your daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Ver uh, chapter four, 4, verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Verse 2, Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Uh, Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Verse 4, then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, grab it by the tail. So Moses reached out his hand, and he took a hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. And then the Lord said, is so, so, uh, and this is said the Lord, is so that they may, what, believe. Right, you're following along. Amen, I love it, I love it. That the Lord, the God of the fathers, of uh, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. In verse 6, he says, Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside of your cloak. So then Moses put his hand inside of his cloak, and then he went and he took it out, and his skin was leprous, and it became white as snow. And then in verse 7, it says that, Now, it, it, now put it back into your cloak. And he put it back, and Moses put his hand back in his cloak, and, it said, and, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if you do not, if they do, if they do not believe you or pay attention to you to, or to the first sign, then you may, they may believe the second one. Verse nine. But if they do not believe the, these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water that you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Verse 10, and Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been so eloquent in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue and the lord said uh, the lord said to him who gave human beings their mouth Ooh, that should be a slap for all of us who haven't answered the call huh? <laughs> who gave you your mouth i'm sure that made moses stop and his jaw drop and just think well you know i'm, I'm talking to god wow. the lord said to him who gave human beings their mouth who makes them deaf or mute and who gives them sight or makes them blind is it not the lord i the lord he said now go i will help you speak i will you what to say and Moses said pardon your servant Lord but send somebody else in verse 14 then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said what about your brother Aaron the Levite I know he can speak well he is already on his way to meet you and he will be glad to see you and you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth and I will help you both to speak and will teach you what to do let us pray father we come to you this morning Lord we didn't come out here to hear a man speak. We did not come out here to listen to a man who speaks from his emotions, Lord, but that he only speaks as your spirit leads him, Lord. 
Father, we come to you, Lord, asking you to, to, to speak to us in our hearts, Father God. To speak to us through that small, soft, whispering voice that we sometimes hear, Father God. That we may know what is your good and perfect will for our lives, Lord. Father, I thank you, Father, for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit here in this place, Lord. And I ask, Father God, that, you would, that, I, that I be removed completely from this message, Father God. And that I speak only as the Holy Spirit leads me to speak today, Lord. In Jesus' name name I pray amen amen so the so the passages that we just read are these are the accounts of of God calling Moses to serve and and and, and when we read these accounts of God calling Moses God never tells Moses in any of this that he's gonna he wants him to serve on his own strength God God at the time that God calls Moses he's 80 years old let let, let me say that again because I don't think you're grasping that He's 80 years old. How many people in here are 80 years old? And are serving God at the capacity that God wants them to serve at? How how many here are serving God at 80 years old? See, not many. Not many. uh, Moses was 80 years old when he climbed up Mount Horeb. Right? 7,000. You know Mount, you know Mount, Mount uh, this is Mount Wilson, right? Mount Wilson is 7,500, I mean uh, 2,000 feet. Mount Baldy is 10,000 feet. So kind of gets you an idea how big that mountain was at the time that, that Moses called it, right? It, 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 and you know what? Uh, can I be honest with you here today? If I see a fire burning on Mount Baldy, I'm not climbing it. I'm not going to climb it to get a better look. At best, at best, I may call the fire department and I may tell them there's a fire on Mount Baldy. They need to send somebody up there to check it out. But at 57 going on 58, I'm not climbing. I'm not going to climb 2,000 feet to take a better look at a fire. It's, I'm too old. I'm too old. And I don't have the physical ability to climb it. I'm sure that there are many of you here uh, this morning, who feel the same way? Like, like I just, I'm just not capable, right? That's right. Amen. That's right. But what if I was to tell you this morning that you're already climbing a mountain? Amen. That you're already working your way up that mountain? That you're already been climbing into the, trying to get to the presence of God, day in and day out, prayer time, reading your Bible, coming to Bible study, coming to church, ministering to people. You've already been climbing that mountain. You've been working and you've been working and you've been hustling and you've been trying to get into the presence of God. And now, now you're standing on holy ground and God is saying to us all today, just as he said to Moses back then, I'm sending you. I'm sending you, tap your neighbor and tell him, he's sending you. Can I share with you that the presence of God is a great place to be? And it's not something that we should take lightly. It's a great place for us to be. And those, those words that I'm sending you, those are incredible words for us to hear. Can I also tell you that eight years ago, uh, when I first opened Fellowship of the Light and I pioneered and planted the church there, eight years ago, I was standing there in the presence of God. I was was the same place that Moses is standing in in this story and in his presence. And 12 years later, now I find myself standing in that same place again. I I find myself standing, God, I find myself standing before God and God telling me that He's going to use me again. And and, and the same excuses that I used eight years ago, I'm still trying to use again today. I'm still telling God, I'm still saying to God, the same excuses that Moses gave him. I'm not adequate. I I don't feel that I know enough. I I struggle with the thought that anyone would ever want to listen to me and that I have an ability ability to uh, communicate effectively with other people. And lastly, I struggle with the thought that I feel that God should be sending someone else. See, my goal, if you will, today, my assignment is to help you to see that the only good excuse before God is no excuse at all. The only good excuse. Did you know that it's not in God's character? It is not in God. It is not within God's character to accept no for an answer. 
To whom did he accept? No. Did he accept it from no Moses? No. Did he accept it from Gideon? No. He never accepted it from anybody that he called. He just called and he said, you go because I'm sending you. The problem with us is that we think that we have to go and there's something that we have to do with it. But it's God who's sending us. We just need to be patient and wait on God so that God can move and minister and prepare the people that he wants us to minister to. So then by the time you get there, it's already done. God says, I'm preparing a table. I prepare a table for you, right? Where's he say that? Psalms what? Psalms 23. I prepare a table for you in the midst of your enemies. It's already done. If God's preparing the table, all you need to do is show up. Right? You ever made a reservation? At a, I don't know why I'm saying this. <laughs> you ever made a reservation at a restaurant? And you show up? And everything's already there for you? All you got to do is sit down and eat? Same principle here. God says, I've prepared that table for you. I've, put, I've given you everything you need. I've put in chairs. I've put in napkins. I got a plate. I got some water. I got everything, food. I got everything you're going to need. All you need to do is show up. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? So, why is there no good excuse before God? Well, I'm glad you asked because I, I, I really want to explain it to you. There's no excuse for God because God doesn't send us on our own strength. He sends us on his. When God first spoke to Moses back in verse 8, he said this. He said, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, I've come down so that you can go rescue them. He said, no, I have come down so that I can rescue them. God is in the rescuing business. And if God is sending you to somewhere or God is calling you out to some place, he's calling you there because he's going to do the work. He just needs you to show up. It's just insane to think that God, that God needs us, right? Isn't it? It's, it, it and, and don't get me wrong. I'm, not, I'm no better than anybody else here. I still think that sometimes, that God needs me. Right? God's got to send me. Right? But it's crazy to think that God, that God needs us when it was God who saved us in the first place, when we couldn't save ourselves. When we could do nothing to help ourselves, it was God who saved us. Now God calls us to go out and we go, well, I, don't, I don't know, God. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can or not. I don't know if I'd be able to do it. I don't know if I can trust you enough. I don't know. God's, 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 he's got to slap us in the back of the head and say, wait a minute. Don't you remember back in, 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 in 19... What, 20 or whatever, however, I don't know how old we are here. But don't you remember that back in, 19, in 2009, when you were dying, when you were in that garage and you were you just gotten out of prison and you were thinking of killing yourself? Don't you, re don't you remember that it was me who took you out of that and turned your life around and, and put you where you're at right now? Don't you remember it was me? Why, can't, why do you have to question what I'm going to send you? Why do you have to question what I want to do in your life? Why do you have to question me? But, but that's how we work. Yeah. And, 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 and my, my, my whole point for this message is to get you to understand that th these are normal questions, right. normal thoughts, normal right. ideas that, that go through, through our heads. Oh. Oh. Can I get an amen? amen? Nobody's hating me yet? No. All right, praise God. Praise. So let's look at the, I want to look at the first excuse that Moses gives, right? The first excuse he gives, and I'm going to paraphrase the first excuse, and then I'll read the, the, the verse. But Moses gives him this first excuse, and he says, God, I don't have what it takes, right? I don't have what it takes. And in verse 11, he says to him, he says, but Moses said to God, who am I? And essentially, what Moses is saying is that I'm not enough. Right. I'm not enough. I'm inadequate. I'm not sufficient for completing the task that you're trying to get me to do. See, the, in, uh, the, the Oxford Dictionary, it, it defines inadequacy as, as a lacking of quality or quantity. It means to be insufficient for a specific purpose. Wow. But it, it, isn't that how we feel sometimes? Like we're yeah. just not enough? Yeah. That maybe we don't have what it takes? I, know I do. I never want to feel like, like I got this. I'm, I got it all together. God, you don't have to tell me. I got it. I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. I never, even coming here, I was telling Pastor Phil, uh, uh, we'll get to that later because it's part of my message. But it, part of feeling like we're not enough is a normal feeling. It's, we're supposed to feel like we're not enough. That helps us to depend on God. If we start feeling like we're enough, then we're not going to need God. And we're not going to be dependent on Him. We're not going to look to Him to help us, to Him to get us through whatever trials and whatever tribulations we face in the course of doing what He's called us to do. 
The apostle Paul felt, Paul felt that way. And when he asked God to, re, uh, to remove something that he thought was causing him to be inadequate. And God said to Paul, my grace is what? Come on. Is sufficient for you, right? Say amen if you're agreeing with me. Okay. Remember you said amen when you want to tell God no. You said amen. I'm, her grace is sufficient. Remember that. you got to remember that. Next time you want to say, oh, no, God, I can't be sent out. God, I can't do the prayer team. God, I can't, I can't come and preach because pastor asked me to. Remember that because you, you, you got to, those things have to come to your mind at a time when the enemy's working on you and telling you you can't do it. You're not enough. Don't even try to get up there. Those things like my grace is sufficient for you have to pop into your head and then you use those to fight against the enemy so that the enemy can not influence you not to do what God has called you to do. Say amen if you agree with me again. Tap somebody next to you and say, his grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for us because God does not send us out to do anything on our own strength. He sends us out to do it on his strength alone. Now, the second excuse that, that Moses gives is, is it, 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 it's, it's a good one, too, because, <laughs> because it's one we always use, right? And the second excuse, he says, what if I don't know enough? What if I don't know enough? What if somebody asks me something and, and I don't know how to respond? What if somebody uh, wants to know something and I, I don't know what to tell them? See, in verse 13, Moses said, suppose I go to the Israelites and tell them that the God of your father has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? What should I do? What should I say? Who, well, how, should, who, how would I know that, that? How would they know that it was you who sent me? See, feeling like I don't know and have all the answers has always been a big issue for me. It's always been a big issue for you. And I'm sure that it's, a, it's probably an issue for many of you here today too. But the truth is that the answers aren't found in us. The answers are found in God. And if you know God's word, the answers are there for you. So if you don't have the word or you don't have the answer and you're not reading your word, then you won't have an answer when somebody asks you. And you don't have to have an answer right away. You do not have to answer if somebody asks you. I mean, I get people come up with some doozy sometimes. <laughs> And, and, and I say, well, I don't think that's what God meant, you know. I said, but you know what, let, I'll say, let, well, give me about, give me a day or two. Let me look at what you're talking about, and then I'll get back to you. I'll put it in the right context so you understand it, and you don't go around thinking that you don't need to go to church. I hear that a lot these days. I don't need to go to church. We don't have to be in church. We, we can have church at home. Yeah, you, the TV, and the sofa. That's not church. God said, where there are three or more in my name, gathered in my name. That means that all three of you have to be able to worship God. And the last time I looked, the TV doesn't worship God. Maybe the guy there does. But that guy's not going to stand before God for you. All those televangelism guys, they're not going to stand in God for you, in front of God, before God for you. You're going to have to stand before God, and you're going to give an account to God for the things that you've done. And when you, look to go, when, you, when you look back and you say, you know what, that recliner was so comfortable, and my Kool-Aid was so good, and I had that nice chair, and I had that big screen TV, God's going to say, but I never knew you. Right. Depart from me, I never knew you. You never showed up. You never, show, you never showed up. You came when you, and when you did show up, you only had half the oil you needed to have. Amen. Oh, man, I don't want to hear those words. I, don't, I dread hearing those words. Depart from me, you, uh, you, you unfaithful servant. I never knew you. Man, I dread hearing those words. So I want to do everything that I can to keep me in right standing with God. Amen. I know there's nothing we can do to be saved because it's all, it all depends on Jesus Christ. Amen. But there still has to be some kind of evidence of our faith. It's not the evidence of faith to say, I, I, I turned on channel 13 and I watched, well, I don't know who's on TV anymore. I don't know. That's not enough faith to say that. Faith is getting up and showing up at church and being the Ben, being, being the Ben Hur at the errand that God has called you to do, to be, and to hold up your pastor's arms while he's here preaching, while he's here sharing the word of God. Your pastor, your pastor goes through a lot to prepare for that message and he comes and then he looks on Facebook and he says, oh, they, they're, 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 they're probably watching me. And I say that because I, I'm, a pa I, I'm a pastor. And I would, I, would I would type things in to see if people were really watching me and they'd never answer. They'd sign on and their name would come on and they're like, hey, say amen. And nobody answers. Not one amen in the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> see, God told Moses in chapter 14 exactly what to say. And if he gave Moses the words to say, he's going to give them to you. 
He's going to give you the exact words to say at the exact time you need to say them. He said, I am who I am. This is what you are to say of the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 through 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Somebody say, all my ways. Submit to him, God, right? Submit to him, and he will make my path straight. He's going to give you what you need at the time you need it. He's going to give you the words you have to say. He's going to put people in your path. He's going to open doors that no man can open. And he's going to close doors that no man can close. And he's going to call you forth to walk through those doors so that he can give you, so that he can impart into you his will and his purpose for your life. The third excuse, I, I got to hurry because I'm running out of time here. I forgot to ask how much time I got, so I'm just playing it by ear. Uh, the third excuse he gives is this. What if people think I'm crazy? And they don't believe me. Isn't that what we feel sometimes? Like people think we're crazy because we're, we're giving them a testimony. Have you ever had that feeling when you're talking to somebody? And you're telling them how, how the Holy Spirit showed up one day and how he saved your life. I hear it all. I see it all the time. I, I, I share my testimony with people and they look at me like crazy. And I say, you know what? You're, not, you're probably not going to understand it right now. But as soon as you turn your life over to the Lord and you start to see him doing things in your life, then you're going to understand exactly what I'm telling you. You're going to see, understand how the Holy Spirit can show up at a time of desperation. You're going to understand how the Holy Spirit can take a gun out of your hand and throw it across the room. You're going to understand how you could open your eyes and that pipe's not going to be in your hand anymore. You're going to understand how when you could open your eyes and you're not going to crave drugs or alcohol. You're not going to crave violence anymore. You're not going to crave women anymore. You can understand that, but you've got to turn your life and you've got to trust the Lord that when he says he's going to do something for you, he's going to do it for you because what you might be saying, my, people might be thinking that you're crazy but you're not crazy you're only crazy for Jesus I remember when I first came to the Lord my wife used to call me a, a, a church weirdo and, and, and I forgave it because I know she meant Jesus freak right? uh, I know she meant Jesus freak she didn't remember the words for it so she would call me a church weirdo oh, you're just a church weirdo and I said no I'm not I'm telling you Jesus saved my life that the Holy Spirit came and he met me in that garage that day when I was going to take your life and I was going to take my life. The Holy Spirit showed up and kept me from doing what I was about to do. Come on, it was from that day I never turned back. I never thought of, I never listened to anybody's story and thought this guy's crazy. I never, because that's how we can be sometimes. We can listen to people and we can say these people are nuts. The other day, the other, the, the other day, this one guy was telling me, we have to start preparing uh, the church for the aliens. They're coming. <laughs> and they're going to want to sit in church too. And I'm like, well, based on some of the things that are going on in the news, I think the aliens are already here. <laughs> so Moses says in chapter 4, verse 1, he says this. He says, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say that the Lord did not appear to you? Isn't that when people think you're crazy when they say the Lord didn't appear to you? To this, God tells Moses to throw his staff on the ground, and his staff turns into a snake, right? And, and basically, basically, this is what God is showing Moses, says to him. He says, show them a miracle, and they'll have to believe, right? And isn't it just crazy also that we sometimes think that we need to look outside of ourselves to show people a miracle? Isn't it sometimes crazy? Like, I, I don't have a staff to throw on the ground like Moses did. I can't put my hand in my shirt and it's going to come back leprous and then I can put it back and it's going to come back healed. Isn't it crazy to think that we need to have something like that to, to, to witness to people, to show people that God, God can do miracles still? When you are the miracle, when you're the, you're the miracle that God has saved, you're the miracle that God has delivered, you're the miracle that God is working in, you are the miracle. You know, all you need to do is be a yielded vessel. All you need to do is go and stand there before them. Give them your testimony. Tell them what God has done in your life. Tell them how Jesus saved you. Tell them how Jesus is working in you. And that should be evidence enough for them to see that there is a miracle going on in you. There is a miracle going on in me. You know, I, I, I don't take that very lightly when I, give my, when I tell people about my past. I, I, I'm, that's the, everything I'm saying is the truth about my past. I come from that dark place. I come from a place of lostness and loneliness and, 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 and all this other crazy stuff that was going on in my life. And, 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 and I've said this before that I, I didn't know Christ when I came to him. I didn't know him. 
but there was a miracle already working in me that I knew nothing about. Because it was my grandmother who told me the day I walked out that front door in 1982 to leave to the army. It was my grandmother who said to me, Mijo, if you get out there and you're in war and you're fighting and you don't know what to do, you call to Jesus Christ and he'll save you. You call him, you cry, and you say, Jesus, come to me. Well, it was that day in 2009 when I remembered, even, even when I was in the army, when I was, in, when I was in, different, in difficult situations where bullets were flying and people were dying, even when I was in those situations, I didn't call out to Jesus. I didn't. But for some reason that day, in that garage, I remember what my grandmother told me. And I was at a place where I needed Jesus. And I called out to Jesus. And he came. And he met me. And he saved me. And he turned my life around. He, turned, he, took, he took me and my wife from homelessness, from drug addiction, from violence. From, 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 he took us out of that. He said, no, 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 no. That is not what I called you for. That is not why I created you. That is not where I have you. I have plans and I have a purpose for you. You are going to tell other people about what I've done for you. And they're going to see the miracle in you. And it's going to turn their life around too. You are the miracle. Tap your neighbor and tell them you are the miracle. We are a walking testimony. Hallelujah. And all God needs us to do is to be a yielded vessel. I believe it was Eddie that was saying that the other day, weren't you, Ed? On Wednesday, he was saying, all you got to do is show up and open your mouth. Yeah. Did you say that? That's all you need to do. Show up and open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit guide your words. So the fourth excuse that Moses, am I, am I out of time yet? Do I got enough time to get to two more excuses? The fourth excuse is this. That Moses gives us, he says this, he says, my speech is not sophisticated enough. I, I, don't, I, don't think I, can, I don't think I can make sense to them when I'm talking. I don't, think the, I don't think I have the words to put together so that the people would, 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 would understand what I'm trying to say. He says in chapter 4, verse 10, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been so eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And when I read this, I can almost feel like God is just struggling, right? Like God is just struggling to hold back. And I, and I can hear his thoughts and I can hear him saying like, Moses, why aren't you getting this, Moses? Why aren't you understanding what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you, Moses? And, and, and it's not what you can do, Moses. It's what I can do, Moses. You have to get this. You have to get let this. You have to put this into your spirit, and you have to let it get down inside of you, and you have to let it. You have to let it move in there so that you get it. Because it's not about you. It's not about you, Moses. It's not about what you can do. It's not about how worthy you feel. It's not about the the, the whether or not people will believe you. It's about me, Moses, and whether or not they're going to believe me because I put I saved you. I gave you your mouth. I give you the words to speak. Why wouldn't they would listen to me, Moses? But God doesn't say that. He says something far more amazing to Moses. And he simply says, and I believe it really gets Moses because it really got me. Who gave you your mouth? Who gave you your mouth? We have to remember that. That it was God who gave us our mouth. He directs our words. He directs our path. He gives us the words to say. When we take into account our own abilities, things seem impossible. But Jesus says, like, things that seem impossible to man are not impossible to God. He says that in, 19, in uh, Matthew 19, 26. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And of course, he's talking about being born again, right? He's, he's talking about uh, going back into the womb and coming out again. And he's, answering, he's, and he's answering, I think it's Nicodemus, right? He's saying, with God, these things are impossible. I mean, with you, these things are impossible. Nobody caught me on that, huh? With you, these things seem to be impossible. With God, they're not impossible. All things are possible. We just sang that, didn't he? Didn't we, didn't we just sing that? With you, all things are possible? In chapter 4, verse 12, God says this as if he's almost fed up with his excuses. He says, now go, I will help you to speak, and I will teach you what to say. You see, we don't go on our own strength. Somebody tap your neighbor and tell them, you're not going on your own strength. You're going on God's strength alone. And the fifth and final excuse, it's really no excuse at all. It's more a request from Moses. It's, it's not real so much an excuse, but it's something that we, I, I wanted to point it out because it's something that we come up with in our own heads sometimes. Oh. And that in, four, in 413, he says, the fifth excuse is this, give the job to somebody else. 
Give the job to somebody else. In 4.13, Moses, it says, Moses said, pardon your servant load, but please somebody, send somebody else. Don't send me. Don't send me. Uh, uh, why, why don't you see, send this brother over here? He's far more, he's far more uh, uh, capable of doing it than I am. Why don't you send that sister over here? She can preach better than I can preach. Why don't you send that guy over there? He's in church every Sunday. See, we're, we're always looking. And, and, and it is crazy. It's really crazy. And I'm going to tell you why it's really crazy. Because we still do it every day. We still do it every time we're asked to do something for God. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to use myself as an example. Because on, on, uh, the other day, when Pastor Phil asked me to, to, to preach, I, 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 at first I said no. I, I said, well, I don't know. Let me think about that. I, I, I don't know if I can do it. You know, I was, He didn't give me enough time to come up with excuses. He could have prepared me for it. So I could have came up with some really good excuses. <laughs> and so here's, here's, here's the crazy thing. I'm writing this message, right? And this message is about there is no good excuse, Amen. right? There's no good excuse, right? That God doesn't take our excuse. So I'm typing this message out, and I'm thinking, I should call Pastor Phil and let him know that we're moving on Monday, and I won't be able to do it, that he better find somebody else. And, and I'm typing away, and then I catch myself, and I'm like, what are you doing? You're, 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 you're preaching and writing a message about not having an excuse for doing what God calls you to do, and you're thinking of excuses as to why you shouldn't do it. But, th but that's how crazy our minds work sometimes. That's how crazy we, we can get when we start to think about things too long. Uh, we start to, uh, what do you call that? We start to, to romance things too long in our minds. We start, to, we, we, we start to think and we start to dwell on it and we start to worry about it. And then it becomes fear. And then we start talking ourselves out of it. And then we blame it on the devil that he, he, didn't, he didn't want us to do it when it was us all along. And that is a true story, but it's not in God's character to take no for an answer. Right. Listen, right. I'm going to close with this here because I think I'm just about out of time. <laughs> Unless you want me to go longer, I can. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not like my wife. My wife can go for you. Got to pry the mic up. And... <laughs> so, listen. My point for telling you all this is so that you don't feel uncomfortable when you're asked to do something. So that when your pastor comes to you one day and he says, hey, uh, uh, brother, I don't know anybody here really. Brother Rudy, right? Lou. Lou. Brother Lou, I need you to preach, right? So he says, come to you and says, brother Lou, I need you to preach. You'll already know that, hey, that's, it's normal feelings, normal thoughts I'm having, normal things that I'm going through. How am I going to prepare a message? What am I going to say? What am I do? Nobody's going to believe me. Nobody will listen to me. I'm not very good at talking. All these things are going to go through your mind. And then finally, you're going to, after all that, you're going to be like Moses and you're going to be like me and you're going to come to the end of all that and you're going to finally say, call your pastor and say, send somebody else. It's normal, people. It's normal to have these thoughts. It's normal to have these feelings. But what you do to get past these feelings, who you put your faith in to get over those thoughts, who you, put, who you trust to take you through all these things depends on you and your faith that you have in God that when you get up here, God is going to move so mightily that he's going to touch somebody. And it might not even be God has to move very, 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 very mightily to reach somebody. It just might be one thing you say. One thing that you say up here can make the difference in, in someone's life out there. One little thing. So there's no good excuse. And the only good excuse is no excuse at all. God will not take no for an answer. He didn't take no from Moses, nor would he take any excuses from us. And, he's, and, and, he, if he, and he is a God who doesn't change, then he won't change with us either. He's not going to take no from us. He's not going to accept our excuses. All he wants to hear from us is yes and what? Amen. And amen. Wow. You know, when I think about uh, uh, someone who, who, who just did what God called them to do and, 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 and probably had some of those thoughts but, wouldn't, but, but, but trusted in God enough to get through them. Wow. That's when I, I think about Jesus. When he was kneeling in the, in the garden of Gethsemane knowing that this would be his last day. He had no excuse before God. And all he could do was ask, Father, are you willing to take this cup from me? Wow. Yet not my will, but yours be done. See, that's what God wants to hear. Oh, that's what God wants to hear from you. That's what he wants to hear from me. It's not my will, but your will, Lord. Yeah, these crazy things are going through my mind. Yeah, my own, my own abilities are, are coming against me. My own 
my own thoughts, my own defects, my own, my own character defects, my own, my own mental defects are coming against me. But I know that if I trust in you, Lord, you can get me through all this. Father, if you are willing to take this cup, he says, yet not my will be done, but yours. Could you imagine where we'd be if Jesus had said no? Could you imagine where we'd be if Jesus had said some, send somebody else? Could you imagine what would have happened if Jesus said, Lord, I'm not eloquent of speech. Could you imagine what would have happened? He was asking his one and only son. God was asking Jesus Christ to die for you and for me. And the only response from Jesus was, let your will be done, not mine. See, there are some of you today in this room. There are some of you who are standing in that same place that I was standing at 12 years ago. And that I'm standing at again today. Where I'm standing in the of God and God has been tugging at your heart God has been tugging at your coat he's been tugging at your ear and he's been saying my son listen to me my daughter listen to me I'm calling you and I'm sending you and are you going to answer that call from God today listen if this message spoke to you today and God and that seems that sounds like you that that this message was for you, you can I, I want to pray for you I want to pray for you because I know some of you know that God has more for you. I know that some of you know that God wants to do more in your life. He wants to, he wants to take you further than what you are now. I know that God wants to use you. You've got a testimony. And if that sounds like you, if you feel like God spoke to you through this message and that you feel like you've been coming up with excuse after excuse after excuse to not do what God has called you to do, let me encourage you. Let me challenge you to take God at his word, to trust in him, to follow him, to go and to those places, those highways, those byways, those deserts, to move out into other places, or even to start a church around your block, around your neighborhood with a Bible study. Pastor Phil is a pastor. And it's a pastor's, it's a pastor's heart to build disciples and send them out, to train them, to teach them, to give them the skills and, 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 and the understanding that they'll need so that they can go out and they can become pastors and they can reach more people and they can affect more lives. If that message spoke to you. I'm going to open up this altar for you to come up for prayer. I want to pray with you that God will strengthen you, that he will strengthen you through whatever doubts, that he'll strengthen you through whatever fears, he will straighten you and strengthen you to answer that call. To be that humble servant that he's called you to be. You have a prayer team that wants to come up and pray. Des, can you come up and pray with me over here? And we're going we're gonna to enjoy the testimony. And you're going to celebrate the good things, you and your family. But this time, we're going together. And we're standing with you. And we're going to be a part of this. Not just in laboring and help, but also financially. Because that's what we do. That's where we believe in investing money in places where people's lives are touched and churches can be established for the glory of God. Would you stretch your hands out, would you please, towards Pastor David, Sister Desiree here and family and her daughter and this home, this household right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift them up to you, God. We ask you, Father, that you would touch their lives. We speak a blessing over their lives, over their home, protection, God, over their physical bodies, Lord. We speak the future, God, and the blessings that you have for them and the lives that only their lives can touch. We know, God, that you are orchestrating something incredible, something awesome. And, Lord, we are going to celebrate, shout, dance, and rejoice as you do this great thing. I pray for wisdom in their lives, Father. I pray that you would bring the people 
that need to be connected with them to do this work. And we right here, Father, will make this connection true. I speak over their lives in the name of Jesus, the anointing of God, onto their testimony, onto their future, onto the words that they speak, into their daughter's life, the protection of God, all the things that are necessary, Father. Lord, you know more than we know what's going to take place. So we pray for your hand of protection on them and the door of opportunity and destiny to be open to them. Lord, we, we trust you like we've always trusted you, placing people in your hands. Guide them, touch them, minister to them, bless them, give them all the words and the anointing that is necessary to do what you've called them and sending them to do. We thank you for them, Father. We thank you for this friendship. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Man, what a blessing. Gentlemen, would you come? Brothers, could you come? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive an offering real quick before I let you go home. And, and this is... This is this is just because they're leaving. They're actually moving up this week. And uh, they, don't, they don't need the help to move. That's already taken care of. What we're starting is the first part of helping this ministry. Drop an anchor. You're going to take a stake. Amen. Pastor David said, he said to me, he says, I, I really feel in my heart I want to go and I'm going to open up as Praise Chapel. Amen. And I said, ah, well, then we're here. And this is what we do. And re really, I don't care what you call it. Just do it for Jesus. If you do it for Jesus and his name is on it, that's what's really, that's what's really important. So we want God to, to be a part of this, but we also, as a church, want to be a part of this. We're grateful. The friendship, the connection that was made, it's, uh, it's, it's all been God. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ability that we have. You have for many years, Lord, many years watched us invest in people, in the building of churches, in the starting of ministries. Some, Lord Jesus, that are still standing, and we're grateful. We, we had nothing to do with that other than being obedient. Some, Lord Jesus, went in areas, Father, that only you could guide them and only you can take them. We know you can do this. Lord, I speak a blessing into this congregation because this is what this body of believers has been brought together for. To help you, Lord, do the things to be a part of what you're doing, God, right here on this earth. You probably, reality, Father, you don't need us, but we want to be a part of what you're doing. Help us in obedience. I pray a blessing upon those who give because this is only the beginning into the, the new the newness, filling the ground in a new place for the Caldera family. Help us to be a part of this, Lord. I speak your blessing into all those who join in with us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's do this if we can. If you want to write a check, you can. You can write a check to Praise Chapel. I'm dying out right here. Huh? The battery or something's getting low. Those of you on Facebook, if you'd like to give, it's real easy. You can do that. You can give online. You can give online looking for Praise Chapel of Almani, and you can join and give. Mark down a gift in there. Put it for um, Apple Valley. Why do I keep having a hard time with that name? I'm going to have to put it somewhere so I quit forgetting it with all the names that are up there. And you can be a part of that. You can text GIVE to 650. That's the area code, 98559. You can do it any way you'd like. Send a check in. Send it to the address here, 4215 Tyler Avenue. And just be a part of it. You don't want to miss out when God does good things like this. But this is only the beginning. Can you say amen? amen. Only the beginning. Amen. God bless you, Pastor David. What a message, bro. What a message. I've never seen people that nervous. But I know why you were nervous, brother. Because you had a message that God wanted to speak. And we're grateful for that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time together this Sunday morning. It was super special, Lord. Super special because of what you did. And super awesome and special, God, because of we, what we were allowed by you to do, Lord. 
keep doing these things, Father. We ask your blessing over this congregation and every family, and we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, God bless you. Have a great afternoon.